Hey, how y'all feeling today? Okay, so today, today's show is about uh, Larry Hoover, Forgotten Prisoners. And today we're going to be talking about this. We have CEO, founder, executive producer of Second Chance Save Life, The Getting Prisoners, and Second Chance TV, Mr. Paul Neal. And with him, we have former special agent with the United States Department of Justice and the host of Forgotten Prisoners, Mr. John Fitzgerald. How y'all feeling today? We feel an outstanding, ready to rock. Good, good. Good evening good, to you. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Well, it's an honor and a pleasure to have y'all on. We definitely appreciate this to talk about uh, definitely social justice and Mr. Larry Hoover. Now, my question is, why Larry Hoover? Well, Larry Hoover, again, everybody asks, why, 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 why Larry Hoover? Why not Larry Hoover? You know, mm -hmm. uh, Larry is a, is a, again, he used to be in, in the disciples or he used to be gang related and all these other things, however, but once Larry uh, got into the system at age 23, as Larry started progressing, as you get older, you get wiser. You know, Larry is an old fella, 70 some years old. He's not a danger to society like they say. However, they stated that, you know, he gonna breathe his last breath in, in this little bitty cell that he's in, in 24 hours a day in maximum security. Now, Larry also has uh, the, the leadership to go out there and tell all these individuals, hey, stop the gun violence, let's put our weapons down. And as he did the gang disciples, he can run uh, the same thing when he first get out, when he get out and say, listen, let's do that. But they don't want him to do that so they can get a lot of more people getting killed and shot and all these gang violence uh, because they know what he brings to the table as far as when he go out and start letting everyone know to stop or just getting out of maximum security, make a video and tell someone to stop. He can't even make a video right now. He's in maximum security. He can't even do anything. So uh, by why not Larry is because he's the one that's been there longer than any other a person, uh, individual. Everybody that was on his case, uh, they was they dropped the charge. They didn't drop the charges, but they left him out. They got 100 years. And someone else was on the same case he was. He got out. You know, why not let Larry out? You know, they were mm -hmm. on the same case. Everybody did the same thing. Uh, however, they, they won't let him out. And Larry Hoover, again, like I stated before, you know, they only letting uh, Tupac Shakur's daddy out because he got cancer, you know, Abdullah Shakur in December, this, this month, actually. But yeah. they won't let him out either. But why not let these men out so they can lead by example and then speak to all the youths around the area that wants to be like Larry, that, oh, I see Larry doing this and see Larry doing that. However, they don't know what Larry's vision is right now to 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 stop the violence, to going out there and, and, and stop the corruption and all these other things. You know, they don't want him to come out there. They don't want him to come out and put a label. But that's what we for. We 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 about to put it down. So yeah, you know, and Larry Hoover again, uh, he's one of the prime examples of, of what the justice system has done to him uh, and everyone else. Not just Larry, but everyone else. Right. So Let's talk about that a little bit, because I know that, you know, uh, with the Larry Hoover case, it's, it's, it's kind of, as they say, like a red flag, right? Because he got uh, he got 200 years, and then uh, they sentenced him again at the, what, a 17-year investigation right. about him uh, <laughs> running a, a whole, supposed to run a whole drug scheme from inside and out. Right. He, we don't know that for sure. Media could put anything they want to put out there. Newspapers could put anything they want to put out there. We don't know for sure, but now they tacked on 17 more years to his sentence, too. What what, what they're saying now is that Larry, uh, when he was into the state prison, uh, that he authorized everyone to put their flags and things down. Yes, he did that. But why did he do that? Because he wanted everyone to unite together and stop war. So when you go into the prison system now, you have uh, the, the, you know, Mesky, the Ma Mafia, you have uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the Muslims, you have white yeah. supremacists, you have, you know, different organizations. And what they do is they go to the yard and you are separated, you know. Yep. Not, so he was like, OK, listen, everybody that's in this prison go all join together, which makes sense. Like, why not join together? And why not like fight each other? You know, that that's what all the prison systems should do anyway, because a lot of times you have these violent and, and, and people killing each other, stabbing each other because they're on the wrong side of the gate. However, if you're in the same prison system, 
and you join together, it won't be none of that. But they thought, or they said, like you said, allegedly stated that he uh, did drugs behind the wall. He's making $100 million a year behind the wall. That's a lot of money, $100, 200 million a year. You know, as somebody to do something like that, man, they ain't no joke, you know. But right. they, they made him look like he was uh, this uh, Al Capone uh, or this mm -hmm. uh, uh, other prisoner. What's his name? Um, uh, the one that escaped from uh, John. You know what I'm talking about. The one that escaped. Yeah. El Chapo. El Chapo. El Chapo. Yeah, they, El Chapo. They, 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 they think he's El Chapo or something. How are you going to be El Chapo in prison? El Chapo can he be El Chapo in prison? You think you think he gonna do it? Come on, he a black man, man. How much power do he got as a black man? We don't have that much power with a black man. You go lock, get locked up, you hit. You know, yeah. but, you know, he just trying to, you know, facilitate people. Then when he was in the area, they go, okay, well now you going to max. We're gonna keep you locked up, and uh, that was wrong for them to do that. You know, it was, it was, and then they say in July that he uh, he announced that he's with the disciples. They they pay these press people to put that stuff on so people can believe that. And, and mm -hmm. you know, when he wrote to the judge, he he believed it and then knocked him down. We're not gonna get he said, just let me get out of Max, man. Just let me get right. out of Max. <laughs> well, let him get out of Max. So yeah. So 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 Mr. Uh Mr. Gerald, um, um Mr. Uh Fitzgerald, Mr. John, since you're here right now, can you give our viewers and, and, and people that's going to be watching or listening to it a better understanding of the law when it comes down to Mr. Hoover and the things that y'all are doing to uh, to try to not just get him out, but like you said, get him out of Max Prison. Let's start off with that. Sure. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you tonight. And please call me John. I appreciate that. Paul, you gave me chills when you mentioned El Chapo because I was in Zacatecas the week that he escaped. I can't go into further detail, but uh, ooh, chills right wow. there. So uh, to answer your question, sir, we're really excited about the show uh, for several reasons. Number one, we're not necessarily defending anyone in particular. What we are doing is raising questions. We're raising right. questions from the perspective of people who know the criminal justice system and understand that it's a big conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. So the first part of the conveyor belt and, and, and the criminal justice system consists of three parts. There is the law enforcement part. That's the first part of the conveyor belt. From law mm -hmm. enforcement, you make your way down the conveyor belt to the judicial system, to the judge. And then from there, you make your way further down the conveyor belt to the correctional system. And mm -hmm. so typically we want to educate people with the show by highlighting individuals like Mr. Hoover. And at the end of every episode, we're going to have what we call case text, meaning based on that episode, we're going to share with our audience some practical information about how they can walk in the authority of the constitutional safeguards and not mm -hmm. come into a negative interaction with law enforcement. Notice I use the terminology constitutional safeguards. Right. Only untrained people say, I know my rights. So when you come into contact with poorly trained officers, because not all officers, well, let's put it this way. I'm very pro-law enforcement. We're pro-law enforcement. Let it be a given that there are well-trained officers, that there are ethical prosecutors and good judges. Let that be a given. But there's enough of the opposite to create this crisis. So we're not focusing on the good. We're raising questions regarding uh, everything from police misconduct to prosecutorial mm -hmm. misconduct, to judicial misconduct. We're looking at the judges as well. So to answer your question, the show will seek to educate people so that they don't do things like say, well, I know my rights. Well, number one, here in California, if you don't know the California Penal Code, if you don't know the California Vehicle Code, if you don't know the Health and, and Education Code, the Welfare Code, you don't know squat. So when you say to an officer, well, I know my rights, that officer is chuckling on the inside because he knows that he's going to metaphorically slap you around a little bit. However, when you say to an officer, officer, first and foremost, I want to thank you for your service to the county of Los Angeles. And officer, mm -hmm. I'm simply exercising my constitutional safeguards. You will cause him a uh, pause mm -hmm. for thought. Why? Because the last time he heard that terminology was when he was in criminal law class at the academy. And so wow. we're going to teach people the language of the law. So, mm -hmm. for example, we're going to teach people how officers are trained in their respective state. So, for example, here in California, all officers go through California 
post standards and it's it's post it's for peace officer standards and training that's the curriculum that every officer is trained by so we're going to teach people about that and there's a reason behind that then i'm going to teach them what the term case law means mm -hmm. case law comes from those supreme court and appellate court cases wherein mm -hmm. the, the judge's decisions dictate all, how officers do their job and then we're going to teach them the term policy manual, because when you leave the academy, an officer's new Bible is now their agency policy manual. Mm. So if an officer gets into trouble, the first thing the investigators are going to want to look at is to what extent his behavior, when you hear the term within policy, to what extent his behavior was within policy. So to the average citizen... We're going to teach them a methodology that I encourage them to memorize. And yes, it's going to sound very fluid when I present it. And people say, well, John, how, unless we have you with us, how do we present that the same way? You will. It just takes a little time, even if you have to memorize it off of index cards. So for example, if you've ever been in the presence of an officer wherein he was just rude to you, I mm -hmm. would expect our listeners to say this, officer, first and foremost, I want to thank you for your service to the county of Los Angeles. But officer, in keeping with California Post, settled case law, and your policy manual, your conduct with me rises to the level of being officious, and it's a violation of your mission statement and values and your commitment to our community, which means that tomorrow, if I were so inclined, I could actually execute an adverse personnel action against you. You will absolutely paralyze that officer because really? he's going to be wondering, who the heck are you? Are you the daughter of a commander? Are you a retired officer? Are you the daughter? I mean, it's just it's just ridiculous. Another thing, untrained people say, well, I'm going to file a complaint with uh -huh. internal affairs, okay? Right. Mm -hmm. Trained people say, I'm going to file an adverse personnel action with the Bureau of Professional Standards. Wow. It, so just, takes, it just takes a little tweaking in how people think and react. And so again, that's just, a, that's just a shadow of things to come in terms of how we want the show to impact the community. Now, let me eventually make my way to your initial question regarding Mr. Hoover. Can't go into great detail. We were in consult with Mr. Hoover, Hoover's legal team several months back, so obviously we're not gonna discuss defense strategy. Right. However, right. I can say this. Mr. Hoover's case is actually bigger than himself. Mm. Because aside from what that, that man has suffered through for the past 40 something years, the fact remains that Mr. Hoover's case is representative of a, a visible pattern within the federal correctional system in terms of prosecution. So mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Sidney Powell, a very famous prosecutor. And she wrote several books about federal prosecution. And what she said is so true. There are few people in the federal government as powerful as United States attorneys, federal prosecutors. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. they, they are stronger in some respects than the president of the United States. They compete with the Supreme Court in terms of the power they yield and federal judges listen to them. So mm -hmm. it's not uncommon for federal prosecutors to engage in prosecutorial misconduct because mm -hmm. they know two things. Number one, they know that 99% of the citizens in America don't know squat about their, their constitutional safeguards. Number yeah. two, they know at the federal level, 95% of the cases are pled out why people don't have the money to withstand a federal trial. And number three, they know that they can break the law knowingly and there's no accountability because people don't really have a pathway to hold a federal uh, prosecutor accountable. A co congressional law years back immunized federal prosecutors. And so there's no incentive to, to encourage them to conduct themselves in a more professional manner because there's no one around to slap their hand. I mean, okay, if you're someone like me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go after his, his ability to practice law in that particular state because I'm going to mm -hmm. file a complaint with the Bar Association for his conduct rising to the level of being in violation of the rules of professional conduct. Okay, so we know that. Right. But most people don't know that. And just because you know something doesn't know that you know how to affect change. Right. So, for mm -hmm. example, the, 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 the reason why most complaints 
Let's use the real terminology. Adverse mm -hmm. personal actions go nowhere when it comes to it. A family trying to let the law enforcement community know that their son or daughter was beaten by a police officer. Okay, excessive mm -hmm. force, police misconduct. Right. The mm -hmm. reason that those complaints go nowhere is that it does no good when you're filling out the complaint form to uh -huh. simply recount what happened because then it just becomes a he said she said quite honestly yes there's surveillance and there's audio and there's witnesses but i promise you that goes nowhere the only time you get the attention of the police commission investigating the success of force is mm -hmm. when you demonstrate in your complaint how the officer's conduct violated their policy manual that's the only way to move the complaint. And you know, every policy man was online in America. You can go online yeah. right now and read all 866 pages of the LAPD's policy manual for those not in Los Angeles, Los Angeles Police Department. And you don't have to memorize all 866 pages. If you simply go, to, go through the three pages, they're the table of contents, you mm -hmm. will see that literally everything an officer does is fashioned for him or her through their policy manual. So if you happen to have a category, like you had a, a canine bite you, you go mm -hmm. to the policy manual and you see what their policy is regarding the use of canines. And then you, you focus on those policies with respect to that canine not having been properly supervised by the handler when this canine bit you. Another thing. Every time an officer says during a traffic stop, well, I'm going to run a dog around your car, people don't know how to respond to that. Well, people don't know that the dogs are trained to respond to the cue of the officer. So they will go ahead and hit because they want to please the canine officer, the handler, not mm -hmm. because there's any dope in the car. And so trained people will say, hey, listen, um, that's fine. You go ahead and run a dog. And I want you to know that my legal team is going to examine the results of this hit. Why? Because if your dog happens to hit in a manner that doesn't demonstrate that there's narcotics in my vehicle, I'm not only going to sue you under 42 U.S. 1983, I'm going to petition to have your dog put to sleep. Why? Because it's not about me. God knows how many people who've been impacted negatively in the criminal justice system because your dog listened to your cue and hit falsely. You you know, there are ways to leverage people, sir. Right. And where, and again, this is just a shadow of things to come in terms of how we want to impact the community with practical real life knowledge. Wow. Because you know, it's it's you just blew my mind right there. You just blew my mind. <laughs> and, and, and and I'm gonna be honest, it's I was always told it's how you say things and how you mm -hmm. know things. Mm -hmm. And you just, just took it to a whole nother level right there that I don't think that our viewers even knew, you know, that certain key words that we can say or certain key words mm -hmm. that are happening that, that we can show people that we really know the law. Right. And the fact that everything is on Google, I'm, I'm best believe I am going there because in the, yeah. in in the city of Philadelphia, the state of Pennsylvania, you know, there is a lot of things that's going on. Um, one thing that I do want to touch on is prosecutors, right? Mm -hmm. So we have mm -hmm. uh, prosecutors, and I know that some of the prosecutors and the judges are all cool with one another, right? So one of my main thing is how can we, uh, I guess, try to level things out for uh, people can get, you know, uh, better sentences or no sentences because mm -hmm. I don't think half of them even know the law. To be honest with you, I think once you say, "Hey, I want to go to trial," then they be like, "Hold up, but wait a minute, you know, we don't really want to go to trial." Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people take plea deals over things that they didn't even do just to, yes. just to say, "Hey, I don't want to go to trial." How can we? Um, and I'm glad you're on here. How can we as a community or people try to uh, know anything about that because everybody, there's a lot of people in jail that took plea deals that they didn't really do the crime. Yes, oh my gosh, you're taking me sound down an amazing road here. This could be an entire semester of criminal justice 101. So I'm going to try to be as linear as possible. In other words, and go in straight a line as possible so as not to lose your audience. So number one, at first, that's an outstanding question. And that speaks to a, a dynamic that needs to be addressed. I'm going to rephrase that a little bit for you. And I want to share uh, this way. 
I encourage people not to be dismayed if they happen to lose at the state court level. Why? Don't be don't be dismayed by it. It's not unexpected that at the state court level, there does tend to be an, a strangely incestuous relationship between uh, defense attorneys, prosecutors, and the courts. And of course, you throw the police in there. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and you, you articulated it a different way, but I wanted to give a little more meat to it. Okay. Number two, I am not a fan. I'm a big fan of the Constitution, and I embrace the Sixth Amendment, which guarantees the right to counsel. But it should be the right to competent counsel. So mm -hmm. in the legal world, the two lowest rungs on the ladder in terms of representation at the lowest rung on the ladder are immigration attorneys. I won't even get into that. The next lowest rung are those working in the public defender's office. Yes. Why? Because they are not trained or equipped. You're not trained. You're not competent simply because you passed the bar exam. Right? You're not competent just simply because you're, you're a licensed physician. Okay? Mm -hmm. 400,000 people die every year from medical malpractice. So you cannot ever assume competency on anyone's part simply because they've attained a title or a position. I would encourage, and one of the things we hope to do is work with local politicians and national figures in an effort to impact state legislatures so that they will do a couple of things in favor of those who fall on the defendant side of things. Number one, there's got to be a compelling reason for public defenders not to always seek a plea deal. If you look at the numbers, they literally plea everything out. Number yeah. two, there should be what I label as truth in sentencing. And the reason that people sometimes will take a plea is that the prosecutors will mess with their head. The prosecutors know that based on the person's prior history, based on the penal code and, and the circumstances of the crime, there could be a sentencing range. That ranges anywhere from, from, and there's no minimum time, and there's no time that's acceptable, but let's say 10 years to 30 years. What they will do is they'll say through the public defender, hey, listen, if you go to trial, you could be looking at 30 years, mm -hmm. right? They don't let this person know, hey, listen, more than realistically, if you lose this trial, you're probably looking at 10 and so because they want to lessen their workload, they will essentially, and it amounts to being lying, because you know what? Okay, yes, it's it's true that the range is, let's say, 10 to 20, but it's in fact a lie if you consider the intent behind it. By presenting that range with the intent of coercing this guy, that in fact makes you a liar. And so these guys will take a plea to something that they didn't do because they can't risk going to trial. And my thing is, if you didn't do it, go to trial. Mm-hmm. And so I would encourage the state legislatures to create a financial fund for those who are relegated to having to use a public defender. So at least they have the option of acquiring the services of uh, a more seasoned defense attorney. Right. But the thing is, when you, when you get into the criminal justice system, you're going to learn that many of the pleadings are nothing but boilerplate. And so it's not uncommon for you to uh, mount a defense and there's a written response, and this even happens in, in civil litigation as well. It's not uncommon for the opposing party to submit a response in writing that doesn't bear any relationship to the merit of your case, doesn't even address who you are. And so it, it, it has an impact on people psychologically where it really makes them feel as though they're being chewed up in this, this criminal justice machine, and it is a machine. Mm -hmm. and, and and those working the machine, their goal is to move as many cases per day, per week, per year as possible. And so we've got to slow that down. And part of slowing that down is not giving the prosecutors and the, the, the public defenders or even defense attorneys so much leeway in their ability to take a plea. And the judges know this as well, but you know what people think, well, I'm just a single person, you know, in a machine that 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 employs 50,000 people, what can my input do? Well, you know what, if we make an input, even on an incremental level, it will move the needle forward in, in a positive way. Now, when you, the major issues when it comes to people who incarcerate at the state level is that oftentimes they are misinformed regarding what is known as a writ of habeas corpus. A writ of habeas corpus really means bring the body before the judge. A writ of mm -hmm. habeas corpus is, is, in a, is an appeal mechanism where when all is said and done and you've been tried and convicted and sentenced and you're like, man, I really wasn't legal. 
I wasn't adequately represented, and I know that the prosecutor withheld exculpatory evidence. Exculpatory evidence is that evidence which would demonstrate, uh, you know, the defendant's innocence. You can file a writ of habeas corpus to a judge in another court, a higher court, and say, Judge, I need you to look at this because this is just a mess. Mm -hmm. Well, oftentimes states have a one year statute of limitations okay. with which to file the writ of habeas corpus. Okay. And if you weren't adequately informed of the statute of limitations, then once you exceed that, then you you really have no ability to seek redress in the moment. And then it it gets really crazy. Now I'm I've never worked with the Innocence Project, and I can't speak to their work personally. I can mm -hmm. say I admire what I know of them, mm -hmm. and I know that they've worked diligently to address some issues in the lives of a number of people. But there's a time factor there. We don't have time. Right. Like we don't have 10 years to spend on a single component. We need to impact as many people as possible by highlighting as, ma highlighting as many issues as possible mm -hmm. through the various episodes, because one of, the, one of our goals is to use the show as a platform for community engagement, okay. where we'll travel to the inner city schools of America and sit down with kids in high school, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, and have these legal seminars where we're literally teaching kids how to conduct themselves as law enforcement because what is happening now is insufficient. I, I appreciate that there are parents, uh, let's say I appreciate that there are minority parents and it's sad that they have to have that discussion mm -hmm. about how uh, the youth should interact with law enforcement. But and this is my personal opinion. I believe that the discussion is insufficient because it's not enough to simply say, have a good attitude and cooperate. There should be some merit behind that because mm -hmm. all that's going to do is well up in the minds of these young people a sense of resentment that whether or not they are they can negotiate this traffic stop successfully depends on their passivity and the good nature of the officer. You know, it shouldn't be that. We really want to encourage our young people to think and to know more about the law enforcement community so they can walk with greater authority in the exercise of their constitutional safeguards. And now I know it seems corny to people that we would say, hey, listen, thank the officer. Officer, I want to thank you for your service to you know Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. The reason we do that is we are drawing from different influences. And what we're doing, we're taking what is known as tactical empathy from the methodology utilized by FBI agents for hostage negotiation. Because mm -hmm. when you study that, and I teach that, you learn that the, the way to mitigate a crisis is to demonstrate an understanding of the person's mindset. It's not about what your intent is, okay? okay. Everything you say and do, it's, it, 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 it revolves around how they're interpreting it. So when you say to an officer, officer, I first want to thank you for your service to the city of Charlotte. You are mitigating the crisis in the mind of this officer. Because listen, officers get killed predominantly in two types of uh, service calls, traffic stops and domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So they're already amped up mm -hmm. as they're walking to that vehicle, right? And yeah. so for you to say, where they're expecting me to engage in some sort of verbal rigor wall, for you to say, thank you for your service, you are actually de-escalating the crisis in that, in that officer's mind. See, oftentimes when officers get, in, get involved with excessive use of force in the field, it wasn't mm -hmm. because they woke up that day and said, you know what, the next guy I meet, I'm going to kick his ass. That wasn't their intention. What happened is that the officer brought the personal crisis from his life to work with him. Mm. And he, he hadn't compartmentalized that. He hadn't put it away in the part of his brain that is just for home. And it spilled over into his professional duties. And it manifested in this next engagement, we call it a contact with the general public. So because I want kids to know this in advance, I want kids to play their part in reducing the anxiety in the minds of the officer. It's all about tone. It's your tone of voice. Mm -hmm. And so one of the reasons why I think that the, the parental discussion is insufficient is that I'm not hearing this enough because I've been all around the city. I started my, my law enforcement career, so to speak, as a tenured New York City English teacher for the New York City Board of Education 40 years ago. <laughs> and that was just an amazing introduction 
to gang activity because at that time the Bloods and Crips, you know, they, they'd come to New York, and well, that's another that's another story. Yeah. But what I found interesting at that time is that the parents were having an insufficient conversation with their kids because mm -hmm. they too were insufficiently trained. And so it's not enough just to pass on family wisdom or generational wisdom. The wisdom you pass on must have it an immediate and a practical application. So you know what? It's more than just, okay, respect the cops. How about respect your teacher? How about respect your neighbor? How yeah. about respect your little brother? You know, it's, it's an entire conversation. It's not just relegated to law enforcement. Oh, listen, you know, I definitely appreciate this. I definitely appreciate this 100%. Now, because I know you can't get into Mr. Paul, you know, um, because I know y'all cannot get into the dynamics of uh, Mr. Larry Hoover because y'all working with the defense team. But can you give us a little bit of details of how certain things are happening around his case that can uh, just bring a little bit of insight that can uh, help our viewers better understand about, you know, what Mr. Paul is doing for Second Chance and, and what you are doing um, about these situations. Because I know that he's in maximum state prison, right? So I know y'all just want to just try to give him a second chance to actually go into, you know, regular prison right now because i know he's probably into simon and everything else but uh you know is there anything that y'all can talk about when it comes down to uh different angles are y'all using or different things that are happening in his case that y'all can see there's a lot a lot of dynamics in there that are not true well first of all um with the larry who situation uh we trying to get Larry free. We're not trying to put him in the back. Okay. Max to, so okay. Larry should be free. I mean, look, it's a lot of things that, again, we can't talk about. However, mm -hmm. we got some things that can highlight and just like I said, bring attention, awareness to what's going on with Larry Hoover's case. Uh, mm -hmm. Because they believe these federal law enforcement, or they believe people back in the times in 1973, uh, just like, me per se say i own and, and i have this i'm the ceo the founder of forgotten prisoners and all of a right. sudden john fitzgerald go out there and do something they go oh, well paul we're gonna get you they're you coming after you right mm -hmm. Let's see it ain't my fault i'm right. not in john's head you know i can't tell i can't tell you what you know what john gonna do next you know mm -hmm. uh, just like right now say you know somebody in, in my organization does something they like well who's the, the Paul Lutal, or oh, well, let's go get him. See, because the thing about it is like, if they want to get you, they're going to get you. And what we are yeah. doing now is spotlight Larry Hoover. I mean, you have Kanye West and you had Drake do a concert, right? All these things mm -hmm. and all this stuff, they just look at you and laugh, right? Oh, mm -hmm. they doing their thing, but he going to still stay in. We got the we, we got We got the beat. We turn the temple up, we turn it down now mm -hmm. because they are black minority people, individuals who's doing it. They don't mm -hmm. pay attention to us. However, mm -hmm. if you got Sidney Powell, John Fitzgerald, and all these government officials saying what happened to Larry and what's going on, oh, it's a done deal now. Light bulb now, now, yeah. now they like, oh, shit, get Larry out of here. They might have a next episode. Yeah. And you see how well John spoke spoke it you yeah. think about the rest of the people we got we just ain't got john don't think we just got him mm -hmm. we got a powerhouse and, and when they on that talking mm -hmm. about that it's gonna raise our brows from the president of the united states to everybody We're like man just 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 let him out because he yeah. ain't cool man we know we, we're not trying to get him in another prison oh we're trying to get him out mm -hmm. and i guarantee mm -hmm. you we highlight this episode not just Larry Hoover, but everybody else episode, like we got Julius Jones or Marquise Rainer and all these other mm -hmm. guys who've been falsely accused. Uh, David Dew, the one, uh, John Chris Jordan. David Dew. <laughs> yeah. Listen, yeah. Man, it's done. Because yeah. now you have the federal, right? Mm -hmm. Going against the federal and the state, which the state, the federal going to take over the state, as you know. However, if there's something wrong in this situation, Somebody got to answer for it. If they don't answer to this one, they got the mark. But 
However, I already know they gonna as soon as that episode hit, they're gonna start letting people out of cages because they don't know who's gonna be the next episode, right? Mm. They make money off of people yeah. in prison. Five thousand, six thousand a day, sometimes lower than that. But if they on medication, they get more than that, right? Yeah. So it's just a money thing. But then it becomes, be honest, it becomes a black thing. Because yeah. more uh, minority black individuals and Hispanics or women may be a, a color race are in prison, right? Mm -hmm. But if you think of it, okay, we, we, we did Larry a favor. We let them other two people out that had 200 years, that had 100 years that was on the same case of you. They at home. What about Larry? Yeah, what about him? It, 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 he should be the same thing. I mean, he, he should have been out. But mm -hmm. they want to play hardball. So, hey, hey, we got the bat and we hit home runs. So that, that's how it is. And I'm not trying to say that because I know God is on our side or he yeah. would have put us together like this. We got, we don't need ones in the world. And it's not in the world today who have a show like this, right? You can see 48 hours, you can see all these other, but we don't want to have a show like ours that getting prisons out with federal agents and stuff like that. They don't have it. Now, you see the Innocence Project, see how far they went. It's this guy yeah. that tried to get out in 40 years. By the time they got him out, he passed away, yeah. right? This one, let go. out. If he innocent, oh, you got to let him out. It's too yeah. many eyebrows being raised when you have the federal government, just like John said it before. That's no good. It's, it's, it's no, uh, it's bigger than what people think when you have a federal prosecutor on board that already prosecuted people and know how to find somebody, a needle in a haystack. I like yeah. that. If I can add to that, there's a, there's a couple of things, you know, to whatever extent people think that I'm articulate or have a practical understanding of the law, I want to promise everybody that on our team, I am absolutely the least capable. Okay, I'm lucky to be here. Okay, <laughs> you lucky? You lucky? I found my way to the Zoom screen tonight. Right? You catch me on the wrong day, and that's my ass. You know. So I, I, I am the least capable. I am so proud of that because all I want to do is is be a, a part of the team. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we can't go into great detail yet regarding the 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 state and federal professionals who are joining us and then, mm -hmm. you know, former FBI agents and we're raising questions and that's why the show is being provocative. So for example, I can mm -hmm. say this, one of our episodes is out of Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. I was just in a conference with his attorney a few months back and the attorney was telling me that to a great extent, he believes that his, his client didn't find victory at court because the judge, both at the state and appellate level, had some personal issue with the attorney going back beef going back 40 years mm -hmm. and so little subtle things like that so what we're hoping to do is we're trying to draw people into the conversation we're going to be confronting many people but not from an adversarial perspective we're okay. going to be confronting people who had their hand in these cases but now mm -hmm. we're seeking to gain their cooperation to move things ahead in a in a in a positive manner so for example i reached out to governor wolf's office Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Of course, I reached out to his office, you know, weeks before the midterm. So they understandably weren't available for the governor to come on the show with us for an interview. But you know what? We'll let the audience know, hey, this is my email to the governor's office. We reached out for comment. They weren't available. Don't infer anything from that. We just want you to know that we want to have we want to have impactful conversations because if uh -huh. we can have conversations. And again, you know, I thank Kanye and, and, and thank Drake and the others who did what they thought was best in an effort to highlight Mr. Hoover's case, mm -hmm. but highlighting and, and, and celebrities play an important role. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to synthesize what they can do with what we're doing. So they have a vast social media presence, right? Mm -hmm. Now they're entertainers. We are entertainers in a different way. Mm -hmm. yep. we're a little, we're a little, our entertainment is a little dark. So <laughs> what we're hoping to do, let us raise those questions. Let us have those conversations. Let us reveal those documents. Let us embarrass those few people. And mm -hmm. then now you come in and help us because now you can spread the word. Because ultimately, I'll tell you right now, if we were, if we were to end the Zoom in five minutes, there was someone right now who could let Mr. Hoover walk tonight. That's right. Mm. That's right. Mm. That's right. Wow. It comes down to that. 
And those are the ears that we're going to be tugging on in the near future. Hey, listen. Well, wow. Well, I'm glad y'all came on the uh, show. I'm definitely glad that y'all came on the show. I appreciate all the love that y'all have been giving Mr. Paul. You yeah. know, I appreciate you so much, man. Uh, because, uh, you know, when I found out about you and, and, and your lovely wife for Second Chance, that actually blew my mind right there. Now you got Forgotten Prisoners. It's, it's, it's even doing even better. So I appreciate both of y'all, you know, for uh, reaching back out to me. I appreciate you, Mr. Uh, John, for uh, coming on the show and, and, and giving us a little bit more insight far as the uh, terms that we can use and insight that you've given us. So I definitely appreciate that about the law. And uh, 